Okay, good morning. Uh, we're going to begin a study of the book of Revelation this morning. I would appreciate your prayers. I know that uh, uh, the lot of, a lot of people today, uh, they look at the book of Revelation and they said, man, that's just, that's a lot of stuff. There's no reason to try to study that. You can't understand it. You have other people who uh, teach certain things that, you know, we're already in the tribulation period or, you know, there's no uh, millennial kingdom and all kinds of different ideas. I'm not going to be uh, studying this or teaching this to protect uh, one particular uh, viewpoint. I'm just asking God to give me wisdom. I, I just want to preach the truth. I don't want to preach something that's wrong. So as I study, and it takes a lot of studying because there's a lot of stuff in here. As I study, I ask for you to pray for me. I pray that this will be a blessing. And God promises that if you read this book or if you hear this book, you will be blessed in a special way. This morning, we're going to start out in Revelation chapter 1. By the way, the book of Re Revelation is not called Revelations. It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. The, the uh, book was written by the Apostle John. It was written to the seven churches that are in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. John also wrote the Gospel of John. John also wrote 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. Now, some people say, oh no, John didn't write that. There's so many differences between what he's written and what's in the book of Revelation. That's because the book of Revelation has a lot more different things than what John wrote about in the Gospel of John or 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. But we'll get into that in just a, mo a moment. The, book, the, the word revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis. We get our English word apocalypse. The word apocalypsis comes from apo, which means away from, and kaluma, which means a veil. So it means a taking away of a veil. So there's so much about Jesus Christ over the centuries that a lot of people didn't understand or they didn't, they didn't get to see him or whatever, especially Old Testament saints. God is now saying, I'm taking away the veil to let you see what Jesus Christ is really like. The theme of Jesus uh, of Revelation is Jesus Christ revealed in glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the Gospels, he was presented as the ultimate sacrifice. We see Jesus Christ revealed in Revelation in chapter 1 verses 9 through chapter 3 verse 22 related to the church. We see Jesus Christ revealed in chapter 4 verses 1 through chapter 19 verse 21 as related to the tribulation period. We see Jesus Christ in chapter 20 verses 1 through 10 as he is related to the millennial kingdom. And we see Jesus Christ in chapter 20 verses chapter uh, 20 verse 11 through chapter 22 verse 21 as he's related to the eternal state. With what's going on in the world today, people are wondering, you know, why why do we have so much evil and God does, doesn't seem to be doing anything about it? Why do we have so much wickedness and whatever, and there doesn't seem to be uh, true justice anymore? The, the good seem to suffer and the bad seem to be promoted. We see it, Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation not only revealed, but we see him presented in the book of Revelation as in chapter 1, verse 5, the ruler of the kings of the earth. There are a lot of people ruling this country today or this world today. We call them presidents, we call them kings, we call them whatever. Jesus Christ is presented in Revelation as the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's also presented in Revelation in chapter 2 verses 1 through chapter 3 verse 22 as the bridegroom and the head of the church. We see Jesus Christ presented in chapter 5 verse 5 as the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see Jesus Christ presented in Revelation in chapter 5, verse 6, through in verse 12, etc., as the Lamb that was slain. We see Jesus Christ presented in chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, as the High Priest. We see Jesus Christ presented in chapter 19, verse 11, through chapter 20, verse 15, as the, the King and the Judge. That's why it's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. This was written by John to the seven churches. 
And when the Lord says that, well, we'll get into that in a minute also. The key verse in the book of Revelation, I would say, is chapter 1, verse 19. It says, those things which you have seen, those things which are, and those things which shall be hereafter. Those things which you have seen, those things are in the past. That's when he received the Patmos vision in chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 20. The things present, those are those things that he wrote to the existing churches of the time, uh, the seven churches located in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. The things future are the things which, shall be, uh, things which shall be hereafter. Those are events after the church age that, that actually end the church age. I'm sorry. Chapter 4, verse 1 through chapter 22, verse 5. And those are all future events. Daniel 9, chapter 24 through 27, chapters 4 through 19. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people, thy people, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, we'll get back into this later on. When you talk about the book of Revelation, you're talking about one section of Revelation, especially that, people, that scares people to death, and that's the tribulation period. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 says, Seventy weeks of years, not days, are determined upon thy people. He's talking about Israel. And upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Why do we have 70 weeks of years presented? To finish the transgression. Israel was always rebelling against God, falling into sin and idolatry, it was just a constant problem with them. Very few, either from either the northern kingdom Israel or the southern kingdom Judah, very few of those folks ever had a really good king, especially the northern kingdom. To make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, in other words, to teach Israel to stop sinning and rebelling against God and to stay away from idolatry and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So, all the prophecy that has not been fulfilled will soon be fulfilled in the book of Revelation. And Jesus Christ is going to take his position as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, when he says King of kings and Lord of lords, there have been lots and lots of kings, lots of lords, a lot of rulers throughout the centuries since the earth has been created. I don't care who they are, I don't, how, I don't care how great they've been, the greatest of them all, the perfect one, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come eventually and straighten out the whole mess. Now, in dealing with the nation of Israel, sin, there are multiple sins, then we're going to have the tribulation period, which is seven years long. And horrible things are going to happen on the earth, worse than anything that's ever happened. And at one point, people are going to beg, please, rocks fall on us and kill us. We want to die, and they can't die. It's going to be horrible. And so we're going to get into that. Now, as we get into Revelation, it reminds me of when we went to Disney World one time. Now, I'm not big on Disney. But we took the kids because we lived down there. We helped run a youth camp down there in Polk City, which was not very far from Orlando. And we were able to go to Disney World all the time. So we go to Disney World. We had three children. Uh, if you go on a ride that only allows you to take one child, then somebody's going to have to go twice. So we went to Space Mountain. We got on Space Mountain. I rode with, uh, I guess, Heather or Holly, one of them. Hope rode with the other one. And uh, uh, an employee kept the, the third child until we got off, and then I had to go ride with David. Now, when you get on Space Mountain, space, if you've never ridden it, Space Mountain, you go up this sharp incline, and it has, if you, you know, first it tells you if you've got a bad heart or if you're pregnant, uh, whatever it is, don't get on this ride, okay? They're already terrified when you get on it. You get on Space Mountain and you get in the little individual car, you and just one other person, they're sitting in front of you. 
So I had my first child, and then later on had David in front of me. You're going up, click, 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 click. You think, oh man, and it's dark. Okay? You're going up in the dark. And so it starts going up. Click, 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 click. And the whole time you're anticipating, oh man, I dread what's going to happen when we get to the top. Click, 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 click. When is this thing going to get to the top? Click, 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 click. All of a sudden it starts to level off. And you don't know if you're going to go to the right or the left. It's just meow, meow. And it's just That's the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 today. And today we're going to be clicking. Click, 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 click. We're not going to get to the top of the rails yet. We're going to start out for eight verses. You thought, eight? That's not many, many verses. Well, listen, there's a lot of stuff in here. So I'm hoping I won't go over time. Possibly I might get through early. But we're going to be going click, 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 click today. As we move on, pretty soon you're going to start seeing more and more and more and more until finally it's like the full blast of Space Mountain. We get into the tribulation period and it's like, meow, meow. You think you're going up, you go down, you think you're going to do this. And, it's just, and you're just hanging on for dear life. And that's what's going to happen during the tribulation period. It's tough. All right. So in... <clears throat> Oh, by the way, uh, John wrote this after he got in trouble with Rome for preaching the gospel. Now, Tertullian, he was one of the old uh, theologians. He was born in 19... I mean, not 19. He was born in 155 A.D., and he died in 220 A.D. Tertullian said that John, at one point, the Romans were so mad at him for preaching the gospel, they dumped him in boiling oil. I don't know if that's true. But God protected him, and he was able to get out unscathed. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, he did seven times hotter than it usually was, and they came out, and you couldn't even smell smoke. The only things that were burned off of them were the things that were binding them. John escaped if he was thrown in boiling oil. He escaped. He uh, was the last of the, uh, of the apostles, of the twelve apostles including Paul. And <clears throat> he died an old man. Some people say that he was crucified in Ephesus. Some people say he just died in Ephesus. But he was exiled after he escaped the boiling oil, if he did. He was exiled to a little island in the Aegean Sea called Patmos. While he was in Patmos, God gave him the book of Revelation. And the book of Re Revelation is telling us what's going to happen in the future. Now, talk about did John really write the book of Revelation? Yes, he did. Something very interesting, if you go into the book of Revelation, you're going to see Jesus Christ presented in, in Revelation chapter 1, verses, verse 2 as the Word. You also see him presented in John chapter 1, verse 1 as the Word. Those are the only two books of the Bible where Jesus Christ is presented as the Word. If you go into Revelation, in chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, you see Jesus Christ presented as the Lamb. In Revelation, chapter, I mean, in John chapter 1, verse 29, or in John chapter 1, in two different places, Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's only in the Gospel of John and in Revelation. If you go to John chapter 5, verses 31 through 32, you're going to see Jesus Christ called the witness. If you go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, he's called the witness. Those three words, the word, the lamb, and the witness, are only found in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, and in Revelation. John's a writer of Revelation. Now, In Revelation, uh, excuse me, in chapter 1 of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's not revelations. We used to have Awana in our church in Louisiana, and a lot of people call it, a, we're going to Awanas. And the Awana representative came by and says, no, it's not Awanas, it's Awana, the children's uh, program. This is not revelations, it's revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. In other words, we're talking about eminence. 
We don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to come. And it's going to come quickly. To, it must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, whoever the angel is, I don't know, unto his servant John. That's the apostle John. Now when Jesus Christ was hanging on a cross, dying for our sin, suffering, and he looked down and there's his mother and there's the apostle John. He says to John, behold your mother. And he says to his mother, behold your son. John took Jesus' earthly mother, Mary, into his own home as if she was his mother. So John is the one that took the mother of Jesus Christ into his home. Who bore record of the Word of God. We already talked about that. The Word of God is found in Revelation when Jesus is called the Word and Jesus is called the Word in the Gospel of John. And the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that He saw. Bless, excuse me. Blessed is he that readeth, verse 3, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which were written therein for the time is at hand or imminent. Now, he says, blessed is he that reads. That means if you read and study the book of Revelation, God's going to bless you in some way. Now, I want us to just real quickly look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Most of you have memorized that, but I'm just going to read it to you anyway. 2 Timothy 3, 16. And it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So what does that mean? God's given us the Word of God, and it's good for four main things. It's good, profitable for doctrine. What is that? That's what's right. It's profitable for, what's, for knowing what's right. For reproof, that's to, that's to know what's not right. For correction, that's how to make it right. And for instruction in righteousness, that's how to keep it right. In addition to God giving us the instructions of what's right, what's not right, how to make it right, and how to keep it right, He gives us this in Revelation where He says, if you read the book of Revelation or you hear the book of Revelation, you will have a special blessing. I also want us to go to chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Okay, so He promises a blessing here and he promises blessing if we read the book now and when he says I come quickly blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book he's talking to everybody but especially the seven churches because it was we as we study those seven churches in, in Asia Minor those seven churches a couple of them one of them was praised and another one was looked on very favorably but the rest of them, they all had something wrong. And he says, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and this church needs to correct this, you need to do that. And he says, you're going to be blessed if you read the book of Revelation and you correct the problems that I brought up to you in chapters, chapters 2 and 3. Okay. So he says, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Because there are some people who couldn't read it, but they could hear it. And you're going to be hearing it. I'm, try, I'm going to try to go verse by verse. I noticed some people like Charles Stanley, he went through the book of Revelation a while back, but he just took like a section and preached on a little section, but didn't go verse by verse. I'm going to go verse by verse by verse by verse. That's kind of tough. You need to pray for me. And it says, Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which were written therein for the time is at hand. Now, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, which are modern Turkey. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. John writes to the seven churches and he says, Grace and peace from him which is. So what is the fact that he is? He's our Savior. He is, which, which was, what was that? Jesus Christ was the creator of the universe. He created the whole universe, which is to come. He's going to come back as King of kings, kings and Lord of lords. So he says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from Him, Jesus Christ, which is the Savior, which was the creator of the universe. You say, well, how is he the creator of the universe? Well, let's take a look at that real quick. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. 
Jesus Christ, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, or God, who has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood. And redemption means that we were in the slave market of sin, and Jesus Christ purchased us out of the slave market of sin with His blood. You can't get out of the slave market of sin without the blood of Jesus Christ. You can go to church for a hundred years and still go to hell. You can be a nice person for a hundred years and still go to hell. You can give your money to the church and still go to hell. You can try to keep all of God's commandments and still go to hell because you are a sinner. And so the only way to be out, get out of the slave market of sin owned by the devil Jesus Christ shed His blood to pay for your sin. And so it says, He delivered us, uh, whom, excuse me, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So when He buys you out of the slave market of sin, you are now free from your old master, sin and Satan. The forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He's the image of the invisible God. You want to see what God's like? Listen to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Watch Jesus. He is the firstborn of every creature. What does that mean? He created everything. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Who's He talking about? The one who purchased us with His blood. Jesus Christ died on the cross, but at the same time, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In other words, He created everything. And it says, For by Him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, or all things were, create, all things were created by Him and for Him. Jesus Christ, they say, well, He didn't become the God's Son until He was born. That's not true. Jesus Christ has always, like Rick said, he's always, He has always existed. And He's credited with being the Creator of the universe. And it says, He is before all, th and it says, oh, excuse, all things are created by Him and for Him. You were created for Him. You really don't belong to yourself. He created you for a reason. Most people don't know why they're on this earth. They're too busy out there having fun, spending money, buying things, going places, trying to look good or whatever it is, and they're wasting their life because they don't know why they're here because God created them and they don't know God. He is before all things. He's supposed to be number one. My, I love my wife, but she can't be number one. I love my children, they can't be number one. I love my grandchildren, they can't be number one. I love life, but that can't be number one. I love my life, that can't be number one. Jesus Christ is to be number one. We will see what happens to people who reject Jesus Christ in a little bit. Not today. He is before all things, and in Him all things, hold, uh, all things consist. And what does that mean? He holds everything together. What? Craig's got his doctorate in physics. He knows more about this than I do. But I know I took, I took chemistry and I took physics and everything else. And you've got an atom. It's got little things in the, the center of that atom. They're called protons and neutrons. Protons have positive charges. Neutrons don't have a charge. I think the neutrons are probably the Lord Jesus. On the outside you have electrons and they're going around orbiting the nucleus. Electrons have negative charges. Now think about this. You ever played with magnets when you were a kid? You have a north end, south end? If you take the north pole of a magnet and touch the north pole of another magnet, what's it going to do? It's going to fly away. If you take the south pole of a magnet and the south, uh, south pole of another magnet and try to put those together, they're going to fly apart. Light charges repel. If you have an atom that's full of protons and neutrons, neutrons have no charge, if they're full of protons, why don't the protons fly apart? Because light charges repel. They don't fly apart because I think Jesus Christ is that neutron. I might be wrong, Craig. 
He holds the nucleus together. He holds the electrons together orbiting the nucleus. If Jesus Christ wanted to kill you, all he has to do is let go of your atoms. You're going to fly into pieces. And so it says, correct me this afternoon at lunch, Craig. <laughs> and so it says, uh, where am I? Oh, okay. He is before all things, and by him all things consist or hold together. He holds you together. He's the glue that holds everything together. And he, uh, he is the head of the body, the church. We are the body of Christ, not the local church. All Christians around the world, we're the body of Christ. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist or hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Other people were brought to life by Jesus Christ. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised other people from the dead. But Jesus had to raise them from the dead. Jesus died on the cross, and He says, no one take, in John chapter 10, He says, no one takes my life from me. I have authority to lay down my life, and I have authority to take it up again. Why? Because He's God. He died on the cross because it was time to die. He says, no man takes my life from me. He says, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he died. Three days later, he came back to life because it was time to come back to life. He told his disciples over and over and over again, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. They still didn't get it. And so he's the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. He should have the preeminence in your life and in my life. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. You want to see what God the Father is like? Look at Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about facial appearance. I'm talking about everything about Him. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, peace with each other and peace with Him. If you're a Christian, you should love your brother in Christ. To hate your brother, God says you, com you committed murder in your heart. But it's also we're at peace with the Lord. Like in Romans chapter 5, for example. In Romans 5, it talks about how we are before we come to Christ. And then it talks about how we are after we come to Christ. In Romans chapter 5, it says, so let's go and start verse 8. But God commendeth or proves His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we were sweet. He died for us while we were sinners. Much more than being now justified by His blood. Justified means God declares you not guilty. You are not guilty because of the blood of Christ, not because of your good works. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. You're going to be saved from hell, and I personally believe you're going to be saved from the tribulation through Him. And we'll talk about that in weeks to come. For if when we were enemies of each other and of God, of other people and God, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, we're brought into a right relationship with God. So before you come to Christ, and people who are watching this uh, at, on the internet, if you're not a Christian, God views you as an enemy. At the same time, He loves you enough for Jesus Christ to come and die for you on the cross and to take the punishment for your sin that He never committed. You and, I, you and I are guilty. He took the punishment. He rose again from the dead after shedding His blood. And so it says we were enemies. <clears throat> we were enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we should be saved by His life. What does that mean? God declares you right, a righteous not guilty. You're brought into a right relationship with God. That's enough to keep you in heaven forever. But to add icing to the cake, Jesus Christ it saves you by His life. He intercedes for you day and night. Look, God, uh, Satan comes up and he can he accuse me like he accused Job. Jim Bell just sinned. How can you call him your child? Look what he did. He's guilty as charged. You need to kick him out of your heaven. And Jesus Christ says, Father, it's true. Jim did sin. However, that sin was paid for 2,000 years ago when I took the punishment for that sin in his place I rose again from the dead victorious and so therefore he cannot be punished for the same sin twice because the, the sentence has already been carried out 2,000 years ago when I took his place so the, the shedding of his blood as a sacrifice 
is enough to give you eternal life when you trust in what he did on the cross, but to add icing to the cake, he intercedes for you day and night. He intercedes. Every time you have a crummy attitude, every time you walk in unbelief, even things, sins of omission, God gives you an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, you just walk away. Jesus Christ intercedes for you, saying, Father, I took the punishment already 2,000 years ago. So if I was found guilty of murdering somebody, and they brought me before the court, and they says, we find you guilty as charged, and we sentence you to death by lethal injection. So they brought me in there in the gurney. They stuck a needle in my arm. They turned it on. I jerk around a little bit, and I'm dead. They take me and put me in a hearse. They take me out to the place to bury me. They put me in a little wooden... Uh, casket, coffin, they bury me in the dirt, cover me up, and they said the sentence has been, he was found guilty, the sentence has been carried out. But three days later, if they went out there and the dirt was clawing away, and I stuck my hand out of that dirt, and I crawled out of that casket, and I'm alive after the doctor declared me dead and the sentence was carried out, Legally, they couldn't kill me again for the same crime. The punishment had already been carried out. Legally, they'd have to let me go if I was able to come back to life, but I won't be able to bring myself back to life. See what I'm saying? Or if someone found me guilty and my twin brother, if I had one, says, No, 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 don't kill me. I want you to kill, I, I mean, don't kill my brother. I want to die in this place. If they allowed it and they killed my twin brother, they couldn't put me to death because my twin brother, the punishment was carried out on him. God will not send you to hell because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took your place. He took your punishment. And he also came back to life victorious over all the sins, that he, your sins, that he was punished for. So he cannot be punished a second time. He'll never go to a cross a second time. And you will never have to go to hell because the equivalent of your hell took place on Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago when he took your place. The punishment was carried out on him. He shed his blood. It should be your blood that was shed. It's like if I died by lethal, in, 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 uh, lethal injection. Jesus Christ, if he, if he died by lethal injection in my place, they couldn't kill me. Because the sentence was carried out on him. But his, my sentence was carried out on a wooden cross that he was nailed to. And he took my punishment for every sin I've ever committed or ever will commit. He did the same thing for you. Now, if you reject what he did on the cross, and if you're still alive when the tribulation takes place, you're going to wish that you had trusted Christ as your Savior. You're in for some bad days ahead. So it says, For scarcely for a righteous man would someone die, yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God proves His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we should be saved by His life. So we go back to... Revelation chapter 1. There are other places. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, I think it is, talks about Jesus Christ through whom God made the worlds. In other words, God the Father says, Jesus Christ is the one who made the universe. If you go to John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among... Oh, it says in excuse me, the first part, All things were created by Him and for Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. Now, back to Revelation. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, verse 4, and peace from, from him which is and which was and is to, to come, from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, what is that all about? Let's look at chapter 5, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns. Seven horns, horns represent power and authority. Seven means complete. So he has complete power and complete authority. And seven eyes, that means he sees that everything knows everything. 
Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. So there's a lamb, and he, through the Holy Spirit, knows everything, has all authority, he sees everything, and he is the fullness. He is indwelled by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So when you see seven spirits of God, that's talking about the fullness, the completeness of everything there is about God. Everything. The seven spirits which are before His throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Jesus Christ never told a lie. If He tells you, like Oprah Winfrey, I mentioned a few weeks ago, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey said, if, if He's such a loving God, why, is he, why do y'all say that there's just one way to heaven? That's because Jesus said, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He's either a liar or he's telling us the truth. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to go to hell. Period. The faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Jesus Christ, no, if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, none of us would either. He rose again from the dead, proving that His sacrifice for sin was acceptable by the Father. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Oh, Psalm 2. Let's look at that Psalm 2. I'll, I'll just quote. Blessed is a man that walk... Oh, excuse me. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. In other words, the kings of the earth are saying, we don't need God ruling over us. His, 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 his moral law and His laws are restrictive. We don't want them. We want to break free from God. And God says, the one who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have him in derision. He's going to mock them. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. He's going to come back as king of kings and lord of lords, and no one will rule over him. Unto him that loved us. How could Jesus Christ love me? I don't know. How could he love you? I don't know. Uh, J. Vernon McGee said, if you, if, you could, if you knew me the way I really am, you wouldn't have anything to do with me. He said, if I knew what you were all about, I wouldn't, have that one, I wouldn't want to have anything with you. <laughs> I can't talk. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with you either. He has made us kings and... Oh, excuse me. He's the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ loves you and he washed you with his own blood clean, so when God opens up your book one day at the judgment, there'll be nothing there but empty pages because... His blood has washed them all clean. God has nothing recorded to send you to hell for. Behold, He comes with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, and they also which pierced Him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Whoa! All right, I'm going to just read something real quickly. I've, I've gone a little bit further than I thought I wanted to go. God often, when He uh, appears to man, he, uh, he, he covers His Shekinah glory his uh, manifestation of himself on earth with a cloud or with fire or with smoke or even the burning bush. And so you can, no one can directly look at the Shekinah glory of God. So God does something to kind of cover over some of his glory. And it says, <clears throat> out here, God placed his bow in the clouds after Noah and his family stepped off, stepped off the ark in Genesis 9, 14 through 16. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud. Satan has stolen that and tried to use that for sin, the rainbow. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. Also, God led the people out of Egypt and through the wilderness by means of the pillar of a cloud by day. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way in Exodus 13.21. So, and the psalmist declared under figurative language that Jehovah makes the clouds his chariot in Psalm 104 verse 3. Nahum says that the clouds are the dust of his feet, Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. 
When God came down on Mount Sinai, He did so by means of a cloud. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Exodus 24, 15-16. It came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of the cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. Exodus 33, 9 through 10, and verses, chapter 40, verse 34. He promised that when he came, he would appear in the cloud above the mercy seat in Leviticus 16, 2. The Shekinah glory was a, was a glory cloud in the most holy place. Israel journeyed in the light of the descension and ascension of the glory cloud. Then the, in Exodus 40, verses 34 through 37, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward on all, in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. A cloud came and overshadowed those present at the transfiguration. Luke tells us, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, son, hear him. I have so many more verses, but I won't read those. When God appeared directly to people in his glory, he covered some of that glory with the cloud. Jesus Christ is going to come back in Daniel chapter, um, I mean, he talks about that in Daniel chapter uh, ch chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. But he came with the clouds of heaven. And behold, he comes with the clouds. Every knee shall see him. I mean every eye. Unless you got eyes on your knees. Every eye shall see him. Now, when the rapture takes place, it's going to come like in the twinkling of an eye. He's going to come in the clouds, we're gone, okay? It's not the blink of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye, we're gone. But when Jesus comes back to earth, everybody's going to see him. Maybe he'll even be on TV, I don't know. But it says... <clears throat> He comes in the clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him because they rejected their Messiah. They rejected their Savior. Now they're in trouble. And he says, I am the Alpha and the, and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and is to come, the Almighty. Now I'm going to quit with this verse. When he says, which is, Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's our high priest. We read in Romans chapter 5 that talked about that. Which was, he was the creator of the universe. We talked about that. And which is to come, he's the king of kings and the judge. And we mentioned that in Psalm 2, but we'll see more about that later on toward the end of Revelation. We're starting out today with the first eight verses. I went, I took a lot, a lot longer than I thought, and because I'm really wanting to teach this correctly, I stuttered and stammered all over the place. So pray for me. I felt like uh, the, the guy who goes into the Olympics, and the very first time it's his turn to compete, and he's nervous, and he's got butterflies in his stomach, that's the way I am today. I'm thinking, this is the book of Revelation, Now i got to get this right. I don't want to mess up. And I'm probably going to mess up anyway. And there will be people out there who are going to disagree with me. But just realize, I want to teach the truth. And I'm very concerned about that. And so for today, I was, I was nervous. I mean, I'm always nervous. But I was really nervous today. I was thinking, I want to get this right. So y'all pray for me that maybe I won't stutter and stammer so much next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the fact that we have a great Savior. We thank you, Lord, that 
you've accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished to give us eternal life, to be adopted, adopted into your family, to have our sins erased, to be declared not guilty, to be brought, in, brought into a right relationship with you. And Lord, we're not, you're not ashamed, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. And Lord, you tell us in scripture, we can call you the Aramaic word Abba, which means daddy. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done, because we don't deserve it. And thank you that you're going to come back, I think, soon. And you're going to straighten out all this mess that's going on in the world today. There's so much evil. There's so much wickedness. There's so much uh, a lack of justice. There's so, many, so much persecution of those things which are right. There are people that hate you. They hate the Word of God and they hate us. But Lord, you're going to come back one day and you're going to correct it all. And we thank you. We look forward to that day. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.